Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about osteomalacia, which is also related to vitamin D deficiency like rickets. So when do we want to think about osteomalacia and what is it? So osteomalacia, just in the simplest form, is bone softening due to vitamin D deficiency. This occurs mostly in adults, but it also can occur in children. So you get insufficient mineralization of the osteoid that's secondary to vitamin D deficiency or defective phosphate metabolism. So as clinical doctors, when do we need to be thinking about osteomalacia? So first of all, you want to be thinking about it if a patient presents to you with bone pain or tenderness or muscular weakness. And then if you see an atypical looking fracture on an x-ray, but we'll go into this a bit more later. So just starting off before we think about the etiology, it's good to think about where vitamin D is produced. So firstly, in the skin, you get UVB, which stimulates conversion of cholesterol esters into cholecalciferol or vitamin D3. It then travels through the bloodstream to the liver where 25 hydroxylase converts the cholecalciferol to calcidiol. And then finally goes through the bloodstream to the kidneys that converts the calcidiol to calcitriol by 1-alpha hydroxylase. So as you can see, a lot of different organs are important in vitamin D production. Therefore, there are a lot of steps where things can go wrong and your vitamin D levels can become low. So this comes into the etiology. So you can think about many different ways in which a person's vitamin D can be low. So first of all, if they've got decreased production via the skin. So in cold climates, there's limited exposure to sunlight. If you've got dark skin or in old age where the mechanisms just aren't as good as they are in young people. Then if you've got decreased vitamin D absorption, so you've got a nutritional deficiency or any malabsorptive syndrome such as celiac disease, Crohn's disease, etc. Then if you've got altered vitamin D metabolism, so if you've got kidney or liver disease, or if you're um, pregnant and there is a greater need for vitamin D, therefore you get a relative deficiency, then you can have um, osteomalacia due to hypophosphatemia or hypo hypocalcemia, and this occurs in renal, renal tubular acidosis and tumour-induced osteomalacia, and then finally, as with everything, there are a lot of different medications that can cause vitamin D deficiency, the biggest ones being anti-epileptics, antifungals, long-term steroid use, and antacids. So a little bit more into vitamin D metabolism. So we've already gone through how vitamin D is produced, but what we can't forget is the interaction between the vitamin D pathway and the parathyroid hormone pathway. So parathyroid hormone is key in stimulating renal conversion of calcidiol to active calcitriol. So, um, and it's like a negative feedback loop. So if we've got low vitamin D, that upregulates parathyroid hormone. So calci calcitriol or active vitamin D3 acts on the bone to release calcium and phosphate and it acts on the small intestine to increase absorption of calcium. So overall, its action is to increase the calcium and decrease the phosphate. So if we've got low vitamin D, because of the negative feedback loops, you're gonna get a secondary elevation in the parathyroid hormone because it wants to stimulate the kidney to produce more active vitamin D. This elevation in parathyroid hormone um, causes mobilization of the calcium from the bone. You get upregulation of osteoclastic activity and then this causes decreased bone mineralization, and then you get osteomalacia. So when assessing a patient that you think could have osteomalacia, here are some of the most important things to be thinking about. So first of all, you wanna be thinking about the key presenting symptoms of bone pain aggravated by weight bearing, muscle weakness, bone tenderness, difficulty walking, and then muscle spasms and cramps, which are more related to hypocalcemia. Then you need to think about their medical history. Have they had any fractures in the past? What type of fractures were they? Were they fragility fractures? Thinking about any malabsorptive diseases they might have, such as celiac disease, IBD, and then again, any kidney and liver disease, just in terms of thinking about the etiology of vitamin D deficiency. And you want to think about any family history of bone disease, renal disease, liver disease, um, gut diseases. 
And then finally, there's social history. And this is really important because your occupation and your hobbies can largely determine how much sunlight, therefore how much vitamin D conversion in your skin that you get. And then as well, thinking about their diet, have they got good sources of vitamin D and how are these symptoms impacting their mobility and their ADLs? So then in terms of examination, there aren't many particularly specific findings, but patients can have a waddling gait. They can have um, deformities kind of similar to seen in rickets, um, but that's fairly uncommon. They can also have proximal muscle wasting and weakness, bony tenderness and hypotonia, which is again related to the hypocalcemia. So if you're thinking that your patient might have osteomalacia, what are some things that you need to be thinking about in terms of ruling out the differentials? So you've got to be thinking about Paget's disease, but to rule this out, do some x-rays and instead of seeing um, diffuse thinning of the trabeculae, instead you'll see cortical thickening, which is diagnostic of Paget's. Thinking about multiple myeloma, but in this case you'll have abnormal renal function, generally anemia and fatigue. Thinking about renal osteodystrophy, and a hallmark of this is an elevated phosphate. Can't forget your osteoporosis, but osteoporosis generally occurs in older patients who've got normal vitamin D levels and they can have normal phosphate and calcium. Then another differential is your bony mets, and in this case on x-ray you'd be seeing lytic bone lesions and they would normally have a normal vitamin D. And then finally a primary hyperparathyroidism, but in this case you'll get an elevated calcium. So thinking about all of these differentials, here's the standard battery of tests that you want to order if you're trying to rule in or rule out osteomalacia. So we want to be doing a serum vitamin D, which will generally be quite low, serum parathyroid hormone, which will be a bit elevated due to the secondary hyperparathyroidism, serum calcium and phosphate, which can be either normal or low, ALP will be increased due to the increased bone turnover, the EUC and the blood urea nitrogen will be dependent. They could be normal, but they also could be abnormal, depending on whether the patient's got renal or kidney disease a liver disease and this will help you in determining the etiology of their um, osteomalacia and then you also want to do some imaging so doing a DEXA scan to look at bone mineral density um, and then also doing hip and pelvis x-rays if they've got specific areas of bony pain and so just up the top here we've got the what you would see specifically in osteomalacia in terms of the blood tests compared to some of the other differentials. So specifically, low normal um, phosphate and calcium, an increased ALP and PTH, a significantly decreased vitamin D, um, and your precursors of vitamin D can be normal or high or low, depending on what your cause is. So moving on to the radiographic features, the most hallmark feature of osteomalacia are looser zones or insufficiency slash pseudo fractures. So these aren't actually fractures, but on an x-ray, they look remarkably similar to a fracture. So they typically occur on the medial edge of the femur, but they can also occur in the pelvis. So there are a few examples of this in these x-rays. So just starting down in this one, you can see its characteristic lucent area surrounded by a sclerotic root lesion. And it looks a little bit like a fracture because of its lucent region, but there actually isn't any fracture in the bone, hence it's called a pseudo fracture. And these also never extend fully through the bone. Then again, we've got a few more up here. So if you see this sclerotic lesion with a lucent region in the middle, and then here on the um, pubis, you can see a lytic lesion with sclerosis around the outside. So some of the other features that you can see, so you can see some diffuse demineralization, so the bone um, looks less white compared to usual. Um, you can get fuzzy or blurred appearance of the trabeculae, and this is due to the lack of mineralization. Again, similarly, you get the poor corticomedullary differentiation. You can get the rickets deformities after prolonged osteomalacia, but this isn't particularly common. 
And then lastly, you can get some articular manifestations, such as this protrusio acetabuli, where you can see that the acetabulum are kind of protruding into the pelvis a bit. Okay, so now you've performed all these tests and you want to diagnose your patient with osteomalacia. Well, unfortunately, there's no specific diagnostic criteria that one is meant to use to diagnose osteomalacia, but there have been some criteria that have been suggested. So firstly, looking for hypophosphatemia or hypocalcemia, high bone ALP, muscle weakness and bone pain, a decreased bone mineral density, and then multiple uptake zones on scintigraphy or radiographic evidence of looser zones, or these pseudofractures. So if you have all of these, you definitely have osteomalacia. And then if you have number one and two plus another one of the others, you probably have osteomalacia. Now, the only way to definitively diagnose osteomalacia is using a rather invasive technique called transiliac crest bone biopsy with double tetracycline lays labeling in histomorphometric assessment. But this is largely only done in research as it's invasive and not necessary as we can just do a clinical diagnosis and see how they respond to treatment. And then you've got your answer without biopsying the person's iliac crests. So then thinking about management. So the mainstay of treatment is if they've got vitamin D deficiency, you want to replace that. So the standard regimen is 5,000 50,000 international units of D2 or D3 orally weekly for 8 to 12 weeks, and then you step down to 800 to 2,000 international units daily. And this can go on lifelong unless the person's risk factors change. So the requirements may be higher in a malabsorptive state because the patient's not going to absorb as much. And then if they have liver disease, you need to use calcidiol as their liver is not going to be able to convert the D3 into calcidiol. And then again, if they've got renal disease, you need to think about using calcitriol or active vitamin D3 because their kidneys can't do the final step in converting calcidiol to calcitriol. Um, so when you start replacing a patient with vitamin D, they tend to have a dramatic improvement in their muscle strength and bony tenderness within six weeks and then their bone mineral density should start to improve in three to six months. And then lastly, the thing that you can't forget is you need to evaluate for an underlying etiology and reverse this etiology because we don't wanna just be replacing calcium if we've got a reversible underlying etiology.